Well, good morning. I see some new faces this morning that I've not seen for like a year. I'm not going to point anybody out, so it takes a snow for you guys. I know who the crazy drivers are now. It's all the crazy drivers. Now I get it. I had to come out and play in the snow. Yeah, we needed snow a long time ago. Now it's really good to be here today. I'm so glad you guys are here to worship with us. Those of you that are joining us online, welcome at, at home. We, we've been in a series, just kind of do a quick little recap called Make It Better. And kind of my challenge, my push for us in this new year is regardless and in spite of all the crazy stuff that goes on in and around us in our nation, in our world, that we would just, we can make this better through what God has given us through the person of Jesus Christ. And so we intentionally started this year with just Psalm 84 where it says, better is one day in your courts, meaning God's presence, than a thousand elsewhere. And we just see the heart of the psalmist is longing to be in the presence of God because that's where life is better. And that we would just start off this year every day just making it better. I know a number of you are reading the the, three, the Own It 365 Bible reading plan and because my email's been blowing up. I just went on yesterday and turned off all my notifications. But it's amazing. And it's awesome just seeing so many people in God's Word every day reading it and, and just you know spending time praying, connecting with God because we make, we'll make this year better by just being in his presence and in his courts. And then the second week we looked at just it's better with God's wisdom. You know, that God's wisdom is far better than the wisdom and the thoughts in this world. His ways are better than our ways. His thoughts are better than ours. And just the importance of embracing the Hebrew word is chukmah. It's his, his mind, his heart. And knowing God's mind and his heart and being in his word and his wisdom will lead and guide us throughout this, this year, this new year that we're in. And then last week, I just really am just trying to challenge us and push us in the midst of all the craziness that we would be contagious and contagious with this hope. We have a better hope, the scripture says, this better hope that we have in the person of Jesus Christ, and we would be contagious with it. And today, I want to kind of continue in, in this, this kind of push. And today, I want to talk about just a strain of bold obedience, all right, that we would catch a strain of bold obedience, that there's all kinds of strains, right? I mean, I was watching the news um, a couple days ago, and, and they think the UK strain is in Indiana as one of the states. Of course, we get it, right? All right, so, so there's this, this new strain, but I want to suggest that there's other strains going on around us as well in our culture, in our nation, and there's all kinds of strains of thoughts and ideologies that are just out there going on, and I think there's even strains in Christendom, all kinds of thoughts, you know, and craziness that we can get into. And so I want to really just challenge us. We don't know, as God's Word says, we don't know everything that's going to unfold and how it's going to unfold, but we, knew does, we do know who does know, right? And so we got to stay focused on the purposes on the, in the mission of God's kingdom. And, and what I want us to do is I want us to catch this strain of bold obedience that we see in the Scriptures, and where, where I'm just kind of getting this in order to make it better, I want to start off with this passage here in, in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And, and this is a time where Saul, this is the very first king of Israel, Saul is king. And, you know, and it's like you feel like they got momentum because now, you know, the, the Israelites, they wanted their own king. They wanted to be like the rest of the world and have their own king when God wanted to be their king. And so they get their very first king. And King Saul many times did not do what God, specifically what God told him to do. And in this particular instance, Samuel here is the prophet of God. He's kind of the priest and prophet, and he's and he's helping part lead God's people as his prophet. And he's coming to Saul and he's rebuking Saul for his disobedience. And this is what he says. It says, but Samuel answers Saul. And he, Saul's going on giving, justifying what he didn't do right. And he says, Samuel answers. says, what pleases the Lord more? Burnt offerings and sacrifices or obedience? All right, now here's this phrase. It is better to what? To obey. It is better. What's going to make our year better? What's going to make every day better? It is better to obey God than to offer a sacrifice. It is better to listen to God than to offer the fat of, of male sheep. And so in this particular context, what happened was God commanded Saul to go to this neighboring nation, this wicked nation, the Amalekites, and he told him to go and wipe them out. Because they were, they were just infecting the world with their great wickedness to go and wipe them out. Don't take anything back for yourselves. Don't leave anything. 
No animal, no nothing. So what Saul does is he goes and he wipes him out, but he decides to take matters into his own hands and he keeps some of the best of the flocks of sheep and some of the cattle, all right, for himself. And then he comes to, you know, and then Samuel calls him out on it and he said, look, and then he starts justifying it. And we all kind of relate to this. He says, look, I kept these sheep and these cattle to sacrifice to the Lord our God. You know, for, for, for religious purposes, I kept them. And this is where Samuel comes in and says, look, what's better? And, and God's rebuking him, you know, through Samuel. says, it's better to obey than your sacrifices. And sometimes I think we can just kind of get caught up. And if I can well, just do this, if I just do this for God. And, and we can see in the scripture is that it's better to obey God than to offer sacrifice. And so what are the th- principles we learn here in this story here? Let me just kind of put this next bullet point up here. Is that what Samuel's telling Saul is that partial obedience is disobedience. Only doing part of what God tells us to do, commands us to do, it's partial obedience is still disobedience. And this is what Samuel is, is dealing with with Saul. And, and, and Saul's trying to justify. He says, well, I mostly did what God told us to do. I mostly did it, you know, but, but you didn't fully do it. And so in this moment, he rebukes him. So the question is, is this, so why did Saul disobey the Lord's command? All right, and I think this is something we can all relate to. It's easy to do. And I just, what we can see here is that because he listened to all these competing voices, right? We've got all kinds of com- competing voices in our world. There's a lot of noise to kind of sift through, right? And, and so we see here, it says in the next pe- verse here, down verse 24, Saul, he's trying to you know, explain himself to, to Samuel. And it says, then Saul said to Samuel, he says, he says, I have sinned. I didn't obey the Lord's commands. I didn't do what you told me. Why? Because I was afraid of the people and I did what they said. Peer pressure. Fear what other people might think. All right, all these competing voices. And Saul says, the reason I did it because I was afraid of what they would do, afraid of what they said, and I did it to appease them. He's got his troops. He wanted them to feel like they went and had some success in victory to bring some of the spoils back for themselves. And he's just trying to justify himself. And Samuel rebukes him and says, look, partial obedience is disobedience. And so God wants us, it's better to obey. God wants us to walk in full obedience. And what I want to just talk about today is just a bold obedience. And so just kind of a question here I'm going to just throw out here. Is it what happens when we catch the strain of bold obedience? That's what we want to look at this morning. What happens if we're going to catch something? As I said, I want us to be contagious with this hope that we have in Christ. But what happens when we catch the strain of bold obedience and living out what God has called us to live out in Christ, in, in the scriptures. And so I'm going to kind of set this up before we get into the text. I want to look at a New Testament passage in the book of Acts, all right? And, and just to kind of set it up a little bit, this was during a time, not very different from today, there was high expectation. A lot of schisms were going around among some Jewish people, even before Jesus and the disciples. It was very common for a rabbi, a teacher, to have some disciples. And Jesus comes on the scene. It's a whole different level. All right, this, this, this person, Jesus, is clearly the Son of God. He, he's just, there's all kinds of signs and wonders and miracles, raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out demons. This is the real deal. So there's this high expectation, high anticipation of what? Of a reset, right? A great reset, a great awakening that's going to take place where, where God's going to come, he's going to squash Rome, and God's going to set up his kingdom and his rule and reign, and things are going to be very different, and God's people are going to be back on top again. All right? Not very different than a lot of mindsets is going on. Now, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what may still unfold. I'm just saying there's a lot of voices out there, okay? And it's easy to get caught up. And even for me, it's easy to get caught up in some of this stuff. But, but during this time, there's this anticipation of a great reset, a great awakening for God to come. And the truth of the matter is, is it happened. It just happened very different than what many people expected. It happened in a way where God came to change hearts. He didn't come to, to tear down a kingdom of man. He came to change the hearts of man. And he ushered in, Jesus comes on the scene and he ushers in the kingdom of God, his dynamic rule and reign, his power and his presence among us. And he hands that over to the church of Jesus Christ and commands them to go and to do the work of the kingdom that he modeled for them. 
And so this incredible thing, this movement of the early church takes place. There's all kinds of miracles and signs and wonders. Thousands of people are coming to faith in Christ. Amidst of all the craziness that was going on in Rome at the day, there's thousands of people coming to faith in Christ. And in one particular instance we're going to look at today in Acts chapter 5, there's, there's these miraculous things taking place. There, there's fear among the church. What happens right before this in the beginning part of chapter 5 is when Ananias, and Sapphira, this couple, they actually lie to the apostles, right? And, and they lied about what, what they did with what, you know, in giving their, selling their land. And, and they die. They both come at separate times. They die. There's fear among the church. And, and the world around them recognizes that these Christians, they, they are real. And there is God's presence. There is God's power. There is a sense of reverent awe among them. And they are standing out from the rest of the world when all this is taking place. And so now the apostles are going, there's signs and wonders taking place. And we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 17, as these guys are just boldly doing the work of the kingdom. And it says this, it says, then, as they're out doing the, the work of the kingdom, there's all these miraculous signs taking place. It says, then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. This is part of the, the Jewish leadership, the Sanhedrin. The Sadducees, for some of you may not understand, that's one. There was two. There was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You know, you could say there were two religious parties, you know, different theological viewpoints, all right? And so they were filled with jealousy. Verse 18 says, then what they did, they arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. All right, so here's why I want us to look at this, okay? In the midst of everything that's going on, and as we move forward, I know for many people, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of questions about what is our nation going to look like moving forward. The reality is, is that there was a lot of corruption in Rome. All right? There was a lot of corruption. It's, this has been going on for a long time. I talked about this a little bit last week. All right? and, but the disciples, these apostles, they're living out the commitment and the commission that God had called them to. And they're being bold. And so the first thing I want us to look at is being, being bold in their faith is that the first thing that happens when we catch this strain of bold obedience is that bold obedience will trigger opposition. It, it comes with the territory. Because as I mentioned last week, we're in the middle of a spiritual battle. And our battle's not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. It's against the principalities in the heavenly realms. We have an enemy, an enemy of our soul, and there's a whole myriad of demons who are out doing the work, you know, and destroying lives and trying to bring division, trying to be hatred, trying to bring all these things. And we've got to stay focused on the mission of the kingdom because as we walk in a bold obedience and what God has called us to do, guess what? The kingdom of light advances and destroys the kingdom of darkness. And so we've got to stay focused on the mission of what God has called us to in Christ. And so what this picture I want us to kind of look at is I was, I was watching the news, you know, the last couple of weeks, you know, and they're projecting that by the end of this month, there's probably going to be 500,000 people die from COVID-19. Now that's tragic. And I know there's all kinds of thoughts and ideas about this whole virus. And, and there's been a lot of frustration, a lot of division over this whole thing. But here's how I want us to look at this. 500,000 lives in our nation is 500,000 eternities. That's 500,000 eternities. And where are those 500,000 people spending their eternity? I think during this time and everything that's going on, this should be a wake-up call for us as the people of God. And I'm, I'm including myself in this. We need to be bold in our faith in living this thing out during this time and everything that we are going through. We've never lived through a pandemic that we're going through right now and all the division that's going on in our nation and we need to be living this thing out in bold obedience. And the reality is, and I'm not saying be weird and crazy and radical and, and, and you know, just being these crazy Christians that are out there. We do it, as I talked about last week, imitating the person of Jesus Christ. Imitating the model that God put in place for us. And in the midst of this, that we, as we're praying and we're seeking the heart of God and we're stepping out in bold obedience, knowing that it's going to trigger opposition because we're in the middle of a spiritual battle. And we see this happening over and over again throughout the history of mankind and through the history of God's people. We go back in the Old Testament. All right, let's talk about Daniel. All right. Daniel, you know, it had been nice. I'm sure he had a dream for his life. He would just love to just live in Jerusalem his whole life. 
is, is just a young man, just living his God, godly young man, living out his faith. But one day, there was this superpower that came, Babylon came, and took over his nation, destroyed the walls, destroyed their sacred temple, right? And, and then took him and a bunch of other, of the best of the smartest of the land, took them into captivity thousands of miles away to Babylon, tried to brainwash them, changed their names, changed, gave, gave them a whole bunch of, you know, of information and education, tried to turn them into Babylonians. But Daniel and his companions stayed faithful to what God had called them to. And Daniel had this practice that he did every day. He would get up. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere, right? He believed it and he lived it and he got up and he spent time with God three times a day, morning, noon, and night. He'd opened his windows towards Jerusalem. That's where his heart was, towards God's plan, God's provision. And he's thousands of miles away in Babylon. He got up and he was faithful and he prayed and God blessed him amidst of the dire circumstances that he was in. He wasn't where he wanted to be physically, but he lived out his faith in God under persecution but god blessed him and god gave him favor before all the kings that, that were there during his time and then one day there was a bunch of people that were jealous they didn't like what was going on among god's people these jews so what did they do they went to the leaders they went to king darius and they said hey we want to convince you to put a new law into place and he manipulated the king to put a law into effect that would harm god's people and Daniel knew about it. And this is what Daniel did. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. It says, But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem, and he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. Nothing changed. For who Daniel was and how Daniel was going to live out his life. Regardless of what the law was, he defied the law to follow what God said, following God's word, following God's voice. And he continued to go and pray three times a day, seeking the heart of God. And these men were furious and they knew they would catch Daniel in this act so then they go back to the king and they rat him out this is what it says in verse 13 it says then these men they told the king that man Daniel one of the captives from Judah is ignoring your law now the law just explain it the law was is it is it for a certain you know period of time that no one would pray to anybody but to the king all right because they knew that the only way they were going to trap Daniel and these Jews was according to their faith and so they had to come up with a law that would impact their, their faith. And so they go and they're writing about that man, Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Now, in the context of the story, we see that King Darius was heartbroken over this because he really respected Daniel. He trusted Daniel. And he knew Daniel wasn't really doing anything bad, but he couldn't go against his decree, the law that he signed. So reluctantly, he had to throw Daniel into the lion's den. That's how he ended up in the lion's den. But the amazing thing is, is that because of God, in his mercy, rescued Daniel from the lions, right? And, but we see that Daniel didn't change anything. He still lived out his faith in bold obedience to God. So I just want to kind of challenge us, all right? I want to kind of inject us, you know, if I could just go around and, and put a syringe in everybody's arm. I know that Roger hates syringes. He, we have to hold him down. But if I could just kind of just, in, you know, you know get, get you just to be contagious and, and to catch this strain of bold obedience, let me just say this. Just kind of put some bold statements up today. If you're not ready to face opposition for your obedience, you're not ready to be used by God. I want to challenge us in this. Because I can, I can just tell you that through the years, and I'm not saying going out and being crazy, like I said earlier, all right, so other people are going to say, oh, he's one of them weird Christians, right? One of them radical nuts, nut jobs, right? I'm not saying that at all. Living out our life the way Christ called us to, being bold in our faith. Stepping out in faith and bold obedience, trusting God, what he called and commissioned us to do, to go and make disciples of all nations. And that means we've got to tell people about Jesus. We pray for people. We minister. We do the work of the kingdom. And I just want to say this, that almost every significant 
thing that I've done in my life through the years. I've been a Christian for like 36 years now. Through every significant step of faith that I've taken through the years, there's always been opposition that's come against it. And so we can expect when we step out in bold obedience and faith that God, that there will, there will be these things. God will be with us. There, there will be opposition that will come. And, and I remember years, years ago when when Cindy, you know, we, we were, you know, our, my wife Cindy was pregnant with our oldest daughter, Rebecca. We made a decision. It was her last year working in the schools as a speech therapist. We lived down in Bloomington. And, and we made a decision that, that she was going to stay home. We felt like God, that's what God was calling us to. We wanted Cindy to be a stay-home mom. I didn't make very much money at the time, very little money. And, and, and we were just going to trust God. And we were renting a house at the time, and we just wanted her to be a stay-at-home mom. We felt like that's what God put on our heart and put on her heart. We wanted her to invest in our kids, as we had, you know, later had four kids. And But I just remember during that time when we made that decision that there was a number of voices, you know, that were saying, well, that's crazy. Why would you do that? She's making more money than you are. Why, you know, why don't you stay home? <laughs> no. <laughs> My kids would be a mess if I stayed home, all right? <laughs> They'd be way off the deep end, you know? So, so it's like, you know, there was all these voices of opposition. It's like, why don't you just both work and whatnot? You know, but we just felt like this is what God has called us to, and we, we walked in it, and we trusted God. And it was several years after that, we were able to buy our very first house for, you know, to live in. And it was a very frugal place, but we, we just felt that God was going to be faithful, and God was faithful that whole time, and provided in ways that we could not see throughout the time. Later on, as we're going through this whole thing, then we just felt like God was calling us to homeschool our kids. All right? We just felt like God put that in our heart. And I know everybody's journey is different and things that God calls us to. And I just remember there were all kinds of voices. Oh, man, you, your kids are going to be churning butter. You know, they're going to be doing just some weird stuff. They're going to be socially inept and awkward and strange. It's all true. But however, <laughs> you know, our kids are doing great. And, and, and our kids that went to college all got scholarships. Okay, our kids have done amazing well. We have two kids in full-time ministry. Our kids are all walking with God. They're not socially awkward. They're living out just godly lives and impacting the world for the kingdom. And we just felt like that was a big decision for us that we wanted to walk in and trust God through that journey. And I remember it wasn't long after that. This is kind of going through the years. Another big significant decision was we had moved from Bloomington up here to, to the Southport area. And I took a job on the north side for a Fortune 500 company. I was an AV engineer. And, and while I was there, you know, I just felt like, you know, we were moving because we felt like God was calling me into full-time ministry. Didn't know exactly how that was going to unfold and work out. And, and so I'm taking this, this really good corporate job, making really good money, you know, waiting for the, the end of the year bonus checks that were going to come. Well, I lasted in that job for three months before I went into full-time ministry. Actually, it was three-quarter time ministry at the time. It, was, it wasn't a whole lot of pay. It wasn't much more than I was making down in Bloomington, but we just trusted God. We bought a house. We were living up here, and we were just trusting God. This is what God was calling us to, and we stepped out in faith. But there was all kinds of voices. It's like, that's crazy. Why would you do that? Why would you ever do that? Now, here's the other thing as part of this, all right? Is it during this whole time, even before Cindy and I got married, during the time of our 31 years of marriage and all the, the risks that we took, we have trusted God with our giving. We have tithed. We have always given 10%, really above and beyond 10%. We support several missionaries, friends of ours we've known through the years, and we give above. We, we, we have always given 10% of our income throughout all 31 years of our marriage and before to the local church, trusting God. And I remember during the time when I was in conversations with people, I distinctly remember some conversations where someone said to me, it's like, that's crazy. I can't afford to tithe. And my response was, I can't afford not to tithe. Because I want to believe what's in God's word and I want to live according to what's in his word so that God will open the floodgates of heaven and provide as he has all these years. And it's taking care of us. And, you know, and, and so it's like through the years, you know, it's like we've talked about church planting. We've pursued it for a long time. We waited 20 years to plant a church. We're just starting a new church and starting this church. And I'm so glad we stepped out in faith, even though there were so many voices. And that's crazy. Even internal voices. Why would you walk away from a good paying job? You know, it, you know, it, and this is like the, the farthest you've gotten in your career. Why would you walk away from that to go and start a church when you have no idea how it's going to pan out? Right? 
you have no idea 2020 is coming, <laughs> right? You have no idea how crazy these people are going to be, right? You, you know, as, and I don't know about you, but I'm just so thankful that we took that step of obedience and trusted God because I love our church. And, and I love this group of people and the things that God's been doing in us and through us. But every step of the way, there will be opposition. There will be internal opposition, your own you know, doubts and questions, and then there will be external opposition. We see this taking place throughout the early church when they stepped out in bold obedience. Now here's the exciting part. All right, let's get into the exciting part. Yes, there will be some opposition. And as we move forward, we don't know what's going to take place in our country but we're going to continue to stay focused on the mission of the kingdom and live this thing out in bold obedience. Yes, there will be opposition, but then the second thing comes. Number two, what happens? Well, sorry, Acts chapter 5, verse 19. This is, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. So here these guys in their bold obedience, they're thrown in jail. Now, Rome gave the, you know, the, the Jewish leadership some, some authority to rule, and they had this common jail that they could put people in. And, and so some of them have already been put in jail. Every chapter 4, they were put in jail then. Now there's another situation taking place. They're put in jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opens the doors of the jail and brought them out. Which brings me to the second thing, number two. That bold obedience opens the doors for miracles. That when, when God calls us to this thing, and we step out in faith and we start living this thing out. It opens the doors for miracles. And so just to kind of share with you another, another story is that years ago, right after I went into full-time ministry, probably two years after uh, I was in full years, you know, full-time ministry, the, um, someone called the church, his family at the church called the church and said, said, hey, we need a pastor to go over to the hospital. One of our family members had a, a massive heart attack and, and they are in a coma. And, and, and come to find out they had been in this coma for some time. And it was just a really sad and really hard situation. And so one of the other pastors, Charlie Cash, who's part of our church, he comes to me and he goes, he goes, tell her, you, you want to go with me and, and go over here and pray for, for this person? And I'm like, sure, let's go and, you know, let's go and pray. And we're talking about it on the way over there. And it's like, man, this is so hard because that day they had to decide whether to, to take them off life support or not. And it's one of those situations where, you know, in ministry, you just, you just hate walking into them. It's so hard. There's never enough things you can say to comfort and console people and the hard decisions they have to make. And so I just remember Charlie and I went in there, and we were talking. We are connecting with this family that I'd known for some time. And, and so we just said, let's take a moment. We all huddled around the bed, and we just laid hands and prayed for this guy. You know, and I'm just, I'm just pleading with God. It's like, God, just come. Just come, bring your kingdom, bring your power. You know, and this person wasn't a believer, you know, and his eternity's on the line. I said, God, just bring him back to life. Do what you do best. And, you know, and we're just sitting there praying, and, and the reality is nothing happened, right? And, and so we're sitting there, we're just trying to comfort the, the family, and then we walk out of the room, we're, you know, we're driving back to the church. You know, it's like, man, that is just so hard, you know, just, just walking through, you know, this whole situation and we just go back to the church and we go back to doing our, our job. And then about two hours later, we get a phone call from the family. All right. Charlie comes running into my office and says, tell her, tell her, you're not going to believe this. He's up. He's awake. He's out of bed. As if nothing ever happened to him. He was fully alive and fully healed. That next week, he came to church with his family and he gave his life to Christ and got baptized. Is that crazy? And so I'm just saying this is like we never know what will take place. You know, it was like we walk away from that situation and it's like, oh. And then several hours later, this guy wakes up out of his coma and is fully alive and comes to faith in Christ. It was just an incredible thing. It was a miracle. And so when we step out in faith and we step out in bold obedience, we should expect God to open the doors for miracles. Now, now let me just kind, of, just kind of give you another bold statement here, and I'm going to come back and explain this. If you're not seeing miracles, then you're not walking through the doors that God opened right in front of you. Because I firmly believe when we look at the early church and what God has called us to, Jesus said you will do the same things, the same works that I do, and greater things because I'm going to the Father. That in all different shapes and sizes, we should be seeing miracles as we walk through the doors of what God has called us to. 
As we see in this moment, they're in jail. An angel Lord opens the door and, and they go back and they continue to do and advance the mission and the work of the kingdom. And every, everything we decided to do throughout the course of our journey and taking steps of faith, we saw God do the impossible because we serve a God of the impossible. Now let me also just say this. We need to understand theologically that what not every person is going to be healed. All right, now let me just explain this theologically, okay? But that doesn't mean we don't boldly pray for them. That doesn't mean we don't boldly step out in faith. We live in what's called the time between the times. When Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus ushers in the dynamic rule and reign of the kingdom of God. God's power, God's presence is here. He hands that to the church. He commissions, he commands us to go and do the work of the kingdom. Okay, to do the work of the kingdom of God, to pray for the sick, all right, to set people free from demonic influence, all these things, all right, but the challenge is that we live in what's called the time between the times. Scholars would say it's the already and the not yet, all right, Jesus ushered in the kingdom, but we still are in our sinful fleshly state, right? So we only see in part, we only know in part, when Jesus comes back is when the completion, the fulfillment, or the consummation of the kingdom will take place, where there will be no more sin, no more sickness, no more disease, no more COVID, no more nothing, no, no more vaccinations, no more anything, because we will then be taken to be in the presence of God. Amen? But during this time, we live in this tension of the already and the not yet. And what God has called us to do is to be bold in obedience and do the work of the kingdom. And to pray for those that are around us. And trusting and believing that God's going to do his part. We do our part and God does his. And there's going to be times, I'm telling you, there's through the years, we've, I've prayed for a lot of people and I've seen some of them healed and I've seen some of them not healed. But you know what? I keep praying. And I want us to be a year that we're going to make it better. And we're going to just walk in this strain of bold obedience. And we're going to expect that we're going to see thousands of people come to faith in Christ in our nation. That we're going to see God come in his power and do miracles. And not get caught up in all the strains and all the thoughts and all the, the, the ideologies and conspiracies, whatever's going on. But we stay focused on the mission of the kingdom of God. Opposition will come. And it may come in different forms. But so will God in his kingdom. Right? I'd be crying too. <laughs> it's, so we don't want to lose what God has called us to. So let's go on. All right, in verse 20, this is what's taking place in Acts chapter 5. Then the angel of the Lord, it says, he says to them, Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. Now here's the thing. We see throughout the scriptures what God has called us to do is to Go right? Our mission statement is, right, is to love God. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. We seek the presence of God. We're to love God, love people, and to go change the world with the good news of Christ. This is what the, the apostles are doing. They're going. The angel, he says, look, you guys are free. You're not in jail anymore. Go. Go to the temple courts and tell the people the full message of this new life. So here's the third thing, number three. It's kind of wrapping this up. Bold obedience requires going in faith. Bold obedience means we have to step out in faith and trust God. Opposition may come, but it opens the doors to miracles. But it requires going in faith. We are commanded to, to go. And so then it goes on in verse 21. It says, at daybreak. So obviously, they're in jail. It's the middle of the night. The angel unlocks the doors. All right, daybreak comes. It says, they went. They entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. Now, now here's the deal. When you read through Acts and you read through, you see chapter 4, it wasn't very long before Acts chapter 5. They were already in jail once. All right, they were already flogged and told not to preach in the name of Jesus, and they just kept at it, and then they're in jail again. Now, I don't know about you, but after you've been in jail a couple times, not for doing something crazy or silly or wrong, not because you were sled riding on your way to church, going faster and spinning out, about the, you're not for doing something crazy, right? But for just for boldly obeying what God has called us to, after you've been thrown in jail a second time, you would, you would kind of probably think twice about it, all right? 
But what, what, what we see in the scriptures, what I want to challenge us is that we don't shrink back in our boldness and living out our faith. We continue to go and proclaim. Because not only do we see with, with Samuel and with telling Saul that partial obedience is disobedience, I just want to say one thing we can learn from this passage here is that delayed obedience is disobedience. Isn't that just what we do as parents? We tell our kids, Right? We tell them to do something, they only partially did it. <laughs> well, I cleaned up most of my room. I cleaned up most of these. Well, you didn't, you didn't fully obey. You're still disobeying. You didn't do everything we asked you to do. Well, it's the same way with delayed obedience, right? Now we tell them delayed obedience is still disobedience. You still didn't obey. Well, I think it's the same way for us as God's children. You know, that he's called us. He's commanded us to go. And to, and to love the world and to pray for those. That there are people in our culture and our nation are looking for hope. And we have the hope of the world in the person of Jesus Christ, the truth of God's word. And so we shouldn't delay in obeying God and stepping out in faith. Opposition will come, but it opens the doors for miracles. And we got to go in bold obedience and faith and trust God to do his part. So let's just close this out. Verse 28, in this situation here is going on. The religious leaders, they, they're, they're telling you know, the apostles, says, look, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, referring to the name of Jesus. He said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined, determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Now here's their response. Peter, and it says, all the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than man. And that's where we have to live. Regardless of what laws get put into place, whether we agree with them or not, whether they are against what we know is true, we stay focused on the mission and the message of the kingdom. Opposition will come, but so will the power and the presence and the miracles of God come in our midst, and the world will know that we are his followers by the way we live out our faith, by our love for one another, right? And by the works of the kingdom of God. So let's be contagious and be bold with this strain of obedience and living this thing out. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.